It's time for Tony Dumont's Game Show Show, where game shows are game to be shows. And here's the man for whom garish isn't a dirty word, Tony Dumont! Thank you, everybody! Thank you, watching online, and thank you, Skippy! Welcome back to Tony Dumont's Game Show Show. For my sophomore effort, I'd like to present another one of the great children's TV game shows of the 1990s. Unfortunately, the subject of this review does not exactly qualify. That show is Nick Arcade, which aired on, no points if you guessed it, Nickelodeon for two seasons, from January 1992 to 1993. Its main selling point was the fact that it was the first game show in the USA to combine live action and blue screen technology. It wasn't the first worldwide. That honor goes to Nightmare, a UK game show that debuted in 1987 and proved to be of far superior quality as far as most of us in the fandom are concerned. But that's a whole different review. Let's focus on Nick Arcade, starting with the intro. Two teams, yellow and red, of two kids each, compete for the chance to enter the video zone and face one of the three game wizards. Only in season one's opening were all three named at the outset. Waiting to challenge you for control of the video zone is one of the game wizards, is it? Murloc, Gorsha, or Mongo? Mongo? Really? I'd expect that name from a hinge person or a minion, but not a powerful wizard. Mongo only pawn in Game of Life. Anyway, the show was hosted by Phil Moore, noted for being one of the few African-American game show hosts of the time. He's also one of the most obnoxious of all time, for being too bombastic, trying too hard to be hip, and, most notably, turning into a Greek chorus whenever the incidental music plays. And now, here's your host, a guy who's written different lyrics for all the Nick Arcade music, here he is, Phil Moore! <laughs> Okay. They're coming back to visit me again. They dig me, man, because they're my friends. Hey. He's writing it down. I can't see him because I'm not looking. Oh, you're done. Okay. Making up lyrics to incidental music is one thing. Fans do it all the time, and I'm no exception. The Nabitra, this is your showcase. This tune can only mean one thing. That's your showcase consists. Solely a furniture, not a trip or a car or a boat, just furniture. Do you need a bedroom set? Maybe a curio cabinet? How about a new credenza? But doing that for the show you're hosting while you're hosting it is something else entirely. Fillmore has said that the reason he goofed around so much is to keep the young contestants from getting nervous, since if he was weird enough, they wouldn't have to worry about embarrassing themselves. And he certainly succeeded. You're probably asking yourself, how did Fillmore get the gig? Was there a nationwide talent search for the most pretentious and unhip black guy in America? Actually, according to interviews, Phil had been doing audience warm-up for years, for many shows, such as the 1990 revival of Let's Make a Deal, where one time, he managed to keep the audience entertained throughout a lengthy production delay. This prompted executive producer Dick Clark to come out and congratulate him personally. It was that moment that inspired Phil to make the move to the front of the camera. This is the comedian, Phil Moore. He makes jokes sometimes. A previous warm-up gig on the third season of MTV's Remote Control, which, like Nickelodeon, is owned by Viacom, was what led to the audition, where his ability to interact with children got him the gig. I suppose his style worked at the time, as Phil was one of Nickelodeon's most popular hosts, and he went on to win an Emmy in 2002 for hosting the children's marine biology show Aqua Kids. But nowadays, maybe it's because the original audience has grown up, he just comes off as annoying. Got more game to play! And all the girlies say he's pretty unfly for a black guy. That wasn't saying anything racist, I was just paraphrasing an Osprey song. Oh, never mind. Here's the front game. There are two rounds, and in round one, one player from each team does the face-off, a head-to-head -head video game developed for the show by the creators James Bethea and Kerry Mateff, along with Saddleback Live Studios and Psygnosis. The face-offs fell into three categories, the Pong knockoffs, Brainstorm, Battle of the Bands and Star Defenders, the Missile Command clones, Laser Surgeon and Meteoroids, and they get the furthest by dodging obstacles games Post Haste, Jet Jocks, and Crater Rangers. The player who scored higher in 30 seconds earned 25 points for his or her team and gets control of Mikey, the show's mascot, who looks way too much like like Mike Jones from Star Tropics. But he's not a total ripoff, because Mike Jones actually did stuff. 
What the players do with Mikey is move him around a 3x6 grid from one space to the next, horizontally or vertically, to reach the goal. They have all these different settings for Mikey, but they only serve as a background for the grid. And with the setting comes an enemy, who varies from location to location, but more on that later. As the team in control traverses the grid in a time-consuming manner, they encounter what the host calls the four P's. Points, puzzles, pop quizzes, and prizes. Yeah! Points mean you get points, of course, 25 to be exact. Puzzles were video puzzles of varying types, where the first team to jump in with a solution receives 25 points and control. If neither one does, the team in control keeps control. They had some interesting puzzles, such as What Was That?, in which a film of an object getting trashed was played in reverse and you had to identify that object. Hyper Channels, where you have to guess what's being hinted to in a montage of mock TV clips. Flash Frame, where you have to identify three out of five related items in a series of rapidly flashing images. And my personal favorite, Fast Forward, which wasn't really a puzzle, it just had players predicting how many times an event would occur in a sped up film clip. As fun and creative as these puzzles could be, they just seemed out of place on a show that was supposed to be about video games. They would have been better suited as the power surge on Get the Picture, which had ceased production around this time and wasn't rerun for as long as Nick Arcade was. What a travesty. Pop quizzes had the host ask a toss-up general knowledge question, usually related to the setting, and the first team, to provide a correct answer, got 25 points. In the early episodes, the team in control would choose the category, but this was scrapped because it took too much time. Wish they did the same for the other parts that slowed down the show. And Prize Squares awarded a prize, usually in the $100 to $200 range, to each of the members of the team that selected it, and they kept it regardless of the outcome. And some squares have the aforementioned enemy. Hold it right there, oh, me brain. Smell pie in the face. And if you land on one of them, you automatically lose control to your opponents. Just like that. And Mikey doesn't even take on these enemies, he just gives in. Some adventurer he is. Note the bombs used to mark squares already used. If you land on one, that's a time bomb, and your team must spell a word in 10 seconds or less alternating players with each letter. If you do, you don't get any points, but you keep control. Otherwise, your opponents steal control. This is actually an interesting idea, and it's a lot quicker than the questions or puzzles. Why couldn't they have had players doing this, or some other quick mental challenge against the clock, more often? In fact, why aren't the kids playing video games more often, since the show is called Nick Arcade? Hey Nick Arcade, here's a fifth P you might want to add. Play some actual video games, why don't ya? Tony, before you get frustrated, what about the video challenges? Right, the video challenges. I was just getting to them. A team that lands on a video challenge goes across the stage, and we must play musical cue, and when that happens... Jealous team comes in back this way. We're in the jungle, booga, 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 booga. I just got back with the mail, got some magazines, and a bank statement. This is a bad film, more impression, mainly because I am not black. One player chooses one of five games, all in arcade-style booths, each of which can only be played once per show. In fact, they were the latest games released for the current 8-bit and 16-bit systems at the time, such as NES, Super NES, Sega Genesis, Neo Geo, and NEC TurboGrafx-16. The other player wagers all or part of their point total on his or her partner achieving or exceeding a certain score in the chosen game, originally called the Wizards Challenge, then renamed the Experts Challenge in Season 2 to avoid confusion with the end game in 30 seconds or less. If the player meets this challenge, they get the points and keep control. Otherwise, they lose the points and control. Of course, the teams never wagered a whole lot of points, partly because these challenges seemed at times a bit too challenging. Previous video game-based shows, such as Starcade and Video Power, would allow the players to practice the games before the show, and this one didn't seem to do that. And since these games tended to be beta versions that weren't available to the public yet, it's not like you could play them at home, especially not those for Neo Geo, which gamers recall as being, as another Nickelodeon personality put it, very expensive. The Neo Geo, from what I've heard, was around $2,000 or so, and cartridges were in the hundreds. If you have that much cash to burn, you might as well have bought the prizes. So chances are most kids didn't have one, or NEC TurboGrafx-16, which I had not even heard about in my formative years. Granted, my video game experience centered around 8-bit Nintendo, but I did watch the commercial, so I had some idea of the gaming scene. Also note that a lot of the games used here are side-scrolling adventure games, and as anyone who has played them can attest, in those kind of games, the points total does not matter as much as completing each round as quickly as possible. So even if you were familiar with the games played, you would have to change your whole strategy. Perhaps the high score game that would have better suited the challenge wasn't being made at the time. But couldn't the producers have devised some games for that purpose? They already came up with the toss-ups. It wouldn't have been that hard for them. 
Maybe you could have put Mikey in them, having him face off against his enemies, as well as those aforementioned game wizards. Actually, the producers wanted to show some of the commercial games on the market, along with their own inventions, and the developers actually paid good money to have their games presented. And it must have worked because a lot of Nick Arcade's current fans watch it for the games they enjoyed. But if you ask me, it's not exactly the best promotion when you see how tricky these games are to play. Anyway, once the challenge is over, we are once again treated to the melodic vocalizations of Phil Moore. We're gonna play some more. We're gonna play some more after we take the points from the score. Yellow team. I just finished taking a shower. I got dried off surprisingly quickly. Why do I keep on singing like this? I think this gag is wearing thin. And finally, there's the goal. Now, in most instances, time ran out before the goal was reached. And if so, Mikey was taken right to the goal and the teams played sudden death, where toss-up questions were asked until one team jumped in with a correct answer, thus earning 50 points. On the rare occasion where one team actually reached the goal, they were asked a question from a category their opponents selected from a list. A correct answer earned 50 points in the goal, an incorrect answer gave the opponents 25 points and the goal by default. This was an interesting twist. It's really a shame it wasn't played too often, considering that it's technically how the round was supposed to end. Then there's the second round, same as the first, with the same toss-up played by the other players and now worth 50 points, as are the point squares, puzzles, and pop quizzes. And there's a new setting for Mikey where the goal is worth 100 points, 50 by default, but again, the chances are still slim that it will be reached. The team with the most points at the end of round two wins the game and goes on to the video zone. And Mikey still doesn't do jack and won't even appear in the end game, thus cementing his status as the most useless video game mascot ever. Why go to all the trouble creating a mascot where a simple blinking dot would have sufficed? Also, why create a whole bunch of settings without doing much with them, except serving as the categories for the questions? On Carmen San Diego, the questions were within the context of tracking down Carmen and her hench people and bringing them to justice. And on Legends, the questions and stunts were patterned after each episode's legend. But here, there is no actual mission to fulfill. Just a goal which most teams don't actually reach since there's really not much of an incentive for them to do so. It doesn't decide the game, it doesn't give them bonus prizes, just a few points that could easily have been gotten elsewhere. What I would have suggested is that if the object is supposed to be to get Mikey past the goal, then that should be the focus. They should throw out the point system and make it so that the first team to get Mikey past the goal wins the round. And the first team to win two rounds wins the game, and if teams are tied at one round apiece, then a much shorter third round is played as a tiebreaker. Also, in each round, Mikey has to complete an actual quest to get past the goal. As a matter of fact, something like that had been done in the show's pilot. All the puzzles and questions could be part of that quest, and to complete the quest, you'd have to take on the enemy in the end. It would be more memorable, like an actual video game. And the show could really use more video games, even though that's what the show is supposed to be about. But they're only used to open the round and provide alternatives to the questions, the way that the stunts on Double Dare are really just toss-ups and alternatives to questions. But they called the show Double Dare because the Q&A format allowed players the opportunity to dare or double dare each other, and that's what would lead to those stunts. If you're going to do a show called Nick Arcade, you have to stay focused on video games. Nick Arcade clearly is not. Its front game is mostly a tangled mix of puzzles and questions. There are some really interesting parts, but they're not video game related, nor do they come into play that often. They could have at least made the questions about video games like Starcade and Video Power did, but perhaps they wanted to make it more appealing to viewers who weren't hardcore gamers, or possibly appease parents who didn't like the idea of rewarding video gaming. So as a result, the front game suffers as a trivia show, a puzzle show, and a video game show. Hey Nickelodeon, were you out for a drink when they were handing out solid gameplay formats? Hey Nickelodeon, you said you're doing a game show? They're handing out solid formats outside. Oh. Gameplay! Yes, sure. solid gameplay! Could I get this to go? Nope. I think they'll be around a while. Last chance for solid game show formats! Let's see if the end game is better. So let's go to the video zone, a live action video game. The players played on sets with a blue screen background with ladders, platforms, stairs, and whatnot, on which the animations would be superimposed and correspond to their movement, which they saw on a video monitor. The video zone has three levels, and to clear each level you must collect three of a certain item while avoiding the enemies and hazards. Five hits and you have to start over again. 
Mercifully, each level contains an item that would help you in some way, such as restoring your power or stalling your enemies temporarily. Each item collected earns the team $50, although the cash isn't mentioned at the end. Each level completed earns a prize, and completing all three levels wins the grand prize. One player does level 1, the other does level 2, and both take on level 3, which was always the wizard level because the game wizards, who had been pretty much absent up until now, show up. Murloc unleashed lightning blasts, Scorcia spewed fireballs, and Mongo, why couldn't he use his powers to get a more suitable name, slung energy blasts. Here the team had to collect three floating orbs while avoiding the creatures and projectiles launched by the wizard du jour. While these were interesting games, it might have worked better if they had more to do with Mikey and his world, considering he's supposed to be the show's mascot. As for the wizards, they could have been a lot more effective antagonists if they had more of an influence throughout the game, considering how many teams couldn't make it to level 3, whether it's because the setup was just too confusing, or the virtual reality still had a few bugs that hurt contestants' progress, or just that the players weren't up to the task. It's one thing to have a technologically advanced bonus round, it's something else entirely to get it done right, and even if it did work properly, or the contestants knew how to play it, it seems like too much trouble for just a minute long bonus round, considering how the front game doesn't quite build up suspense towards it. Sonic Arcade is clearly a popular and well-remembered show even to this day. However, it is not without a significant number of flaws, the biggest of which, the fact that there's not enough in it to do with video games. The most interesting parts of Nick Arcade are the goal and the time bomb, which aren't even played that often, and the puzzles. All of which have jack to do with video games, so around here, it seems like they went to waste. Sure, Nick Arcade was innovative and original in terms of video gaming and technology, and I enjoyed the animation and original games, which I would have liked to have seen released in stores. However, they didn't do as much with them as they should have done. In fact, they should have gotten the bugs out first. The background music's okay and so is the set, though I prefer the Season 1 set as it was more colorful and brighter. However, none of this compensates for the slow and clunky front game and a host who grates much too quickly. Overall, Nick Arcade is not one of Nickelodeon's better game shows. It's not their worst ever, nor is it the worst video game based game show ever. Still, Nick Arcade, like Mikey, only seldom reaches its goal. Now I'm done with the review! I don't know what I'll be doing. That's enough, Tony! Skippy's had a I made it! Thing. One more song interlude and I will blow my brains out! Skippy just threatened to blow out his brains, but I don't suppose he actually. <laughs> oh dear. Guess what, Fillmore? Now you are indirectly responsible for Skippy's untimely demise. His blood will forever be on your hands. Now I'd like to take a moment of silence in remembrance of my fallen announcer. Now I'm taking a moment of silence. I know that this defeats the purpose, but I can't help. I already start... I can't take it anymore! Skippy, I hope there's one bullet left! Thank <laughs> you.